taking the time and helping us out. Uh, tonight's topic is distressed properties. I'm very excited to talk about distressed. I know a lot of you have reached out to Candace and have said, we need some training. And when I look back, it has been almost a year since we did a training like this one. So um, back by popular demand, I don't know if I, it's really popular. I mean, distress is never a good thing to talk about. And I was telling Shannon, we're going to do distress. She's like, really distressed? <laughs> but but we're going to give you some tips and some tricks to make your life a little bit easier on navigating. Some of you have not done distressed properties at one point in time back in, geez, I almost want to date myself, 2009 and 10, over half of my business was distressed properties. So I took classes. I took every train I could get my hands on, like many of you old timers out there. Um, so today I'm bringing to you kind of the latest and greatest for tips on how to handle distressed properties. So let's go to the next slide. Before I jump into it, I just want to remind all of you, I think to understand what a distressed property is, we have to do a better job as listing agents of going over net sheets with our sellers and understanding what they are going to take away. I don't think I can emphasize this enough. That's why I put it here at the very beginning of my presentation, because many of you who are new to the business or have not experienced distressed listings or helping distressed buyers navigate this kind of uncharted territory, uh, maybe you are you got your license since 2010, 11, and 12, um, and you don't understand how important this really is. And that's one of the key things that I did as we were going into a distressed market was I always built my listing business around the net sheet. I never wanted to withhold this very important information from my sellers. So they make it easy. There's a Tycor agent. One is the one I use, but Chicago, Fidelity, Tycor, First American, all the title companies for the most part have a mobile app that allows you to do a net sheet right on your phone. So there really is no reason why you cannot go over the net sheet with your sellers. MLS even has it. You go into financial tools, you click on financial tools, and there you go. You've got a calculator right there on the on your um, on your homepage. So types of distress. As we look at these two photos, it gives me a little bit of heartburn because I remember these properties and I remember them well. Um, and these are types of distress that you're going to encounter. If you have not encountered in your real estate career, I guess you have not been in the business long enough because you're going to encounter it. If you've ever... Um, dealt with a seller who is financial stressed as far as not have too much debt, um, maybe didn't pay their taxes. Um, my mom bought an investment property one time and she forgot that she thought the mortgage company was taking the taxes out. She's like, oh shoot, I've got to pay my taxes. Well, if she would have continued to do that and not paid her taxes, there could be a problem with her, um, her mortgage and obviously foreclosure and distress starts to happen. Luckily for her, she paid off um, the taxes and everything was good. Death often causes distress situations, uh, medical or health conditions that are kind of out of, you know, out of the norm, unemployment, sudden job loss, lots of change, natural disasters. Knock on wood, we haven't had anything in recent um, as far as natural disasters, but that can cause distress in certain marketplaces. Legal problems that um, sellers get themselves involved in. Shannon and I have one right now that is um, a legal, well, judgments. Couple. Judgments that we have to clear. Um, luckily, we're not in too much of a stress. They have equity in their property uh, and certainly market conditions. Some of us think that the market may change. I often think it's not. And based on the numbers I'm seeing, I'm not going to see I think the distress that we're going to see in our area is going to come from things like death, divorce, medical, financial, things of that nature, um, and less about the marketplace. Our job market and the way our market and the lack of inventory has caused the market conditions to actually be a seller's market, which doesn't really bode well for distressed properties. So um, some of the other things up above are going to be most of the types of distress you're going to deal with. So the lingo, some of you need are newer to the business, or maybe you need a refresher on this. If you're going from maybe not working in a distressed marketplace, um, you might hear things like my client's going through a BK, that would be a bankruptcy. Um, I'm going to be doing a BPO, that would be a broker price opinion that's done for short sales um, or pre-foreclosures. 
Um, an SS, so a lot of forms say SS on it, that would be a short sale. Short sale would be somebody that owes more on their property than what the property is worth. And what you'll find in our marketplace is there's actually very few of those short sales on the market. Um, however, you might see some coming on the market here this spring because of the situations or the distress that people might be in encountering. You'll hear what we call lien holder approval, and that's when the short sale has been approved by the bank and they are allowed to move forward with the sale. Third party approval is a short sale or a foreclosure. So that's when the third party will go ahead and, and authorize it. A negotiator is often used in short sales. Now, I could negotiate my own short sales um, back in the day when there were two liens on the property or two back in, in the 2008, we were doing what they called 80-20 loans, where basically the 100% financing, we get one, lo one loan from one bank and then the 20% from a completely another bank. I'm really dating myself now. <laughs> so in order to, when those were short sales back in 2009 and 10 um, or 2008, we would usually hire a negotiator from an attorney or a law firm or from somebody who'd done a lot of negotiations with those second um, lien holder positions. That's when we usually would hire a negotiator. So I just want to kind of bring these terms to you so that you know. So if somebody's using these terms, you know how what the lingo is. If it's just one lien that needs to be paid or go, going through that short sale process, oftentimes um, I can assist you in negotiating through that process because of the experiences that I've had. As we go into the second set of lingo, you've got the NODs, which is the notice of defaults. Notice it just rolls off my tongue. Um, I used to work a lot of NODs um, where I make phone calls for people. I was in a call center. I managed a call center with people calling on NODs. So that's an option for some of you who may find that that is something you want to do. Uh, Pre-foreclosures, that's sometimes often misunderstood. Um, sometimes they think it's those are short sales. They could be, but sometimes it's not. It's usually the time between where an NOD and goes through that process where that notice is put on the front door um, or delivered, and then the actual foreclosure. I have been able to get some of my closed clients in my past some fantastic deals with pre-foreclosures, but they do take a lot of um, work, timing, and do require cash most of the time with those pre-foreclosures. It's not something where often you can get a loan for those pre-foreclosures. You actually have to have hard money or cash to actually play in that space. HUD foreclosures, though, happen to allow for financed um, buyers. They don't think of cash any way different than um, somebody that is going to get financing. So HUD Home Store, we actually are licensed bidders. I don't know if you guys knew this, but um, Best Choice Realty is licensed and we can bid on any properties that you see on the HUD website. Those are foreclosures and they do have a process and there is um, training that you can take on, on how to do those HUD bidding exercises. And then the last one would be REOs, the real estate owned by a lender after a foreclosure. So that's when the foreclosure happens and then the bank is the seller. And so there were a lot of REO properties in the 2008, 9, 10, 11 years uh, that you guys would find. So that's kind of some lingo. Um, many of you are like, okay, well, okay, that's great, Rochelle, but then how do I prospect? Is there any opportunities for me to jump in and kind of prospect for those potential sellers? And the answer is yes, um, but it does take work. You do have to play in some of these spaces that you see here on the screen. Realty track, foreclosures.com, auction.com. Um, those are websites that I used to frequent when I was doing distressed properties. Um, certainly Zillow, Realtor, Trulia will put properties that will maybe tease your buyers. And so you will need to familiarize yourself with how some of those websites actually display the dis distressed properties so that you can talk very openly with your um, clients about the distress situation, such as I had a buyer, um, first time home buyers, they're usually the worst, no offense, first time home buyers, but you don't have enough knowledge on how to actually move forward with some of those distressed properties. And so they'll think that they can finance bless their little hearts. Um, the realtor.com, they see something from um, like an REO and it's going to require a cash buyer or a, a hard money lender. 
So you'll have to educate them that that first time buyer program or that Washington state housing program, that down payment assistance program may not work for some of those properties that they see on some of those websites. Yeah. If you're driving around, if you see a property like that, that's that hit the pavement, you might want to go and find out who owns that property. Maybe it's an REO, maybe it's the bank, maybe there was a notice of default, an NOD that was um, supplied on that property. And then you just have to hunt down who the property owner is and engage them in letting them know that you would be happy to help them um, list their property and get that done before it goes to foreclosure. So definitely wholesalers, tax delinquent lists, many of these lists you can get from your um, title company, they can get you in touch with some of these websites that will get you lists if that's something you want or desire to work. Um, if you have any other ideas of places that you have frequented to pick up some of these um, for foreclosures, pre-foreclosures or short sales, certainly go ahead and put that in the chat so people on our um, in our group can get some ideas of how they can prospect for these types of opportunities. As a quick reminder, the Washington short sale advisor is required. Say I went and drove by that house you saw on the past screen and I wanted to engage with that seller. I would need to advise that seller of their rights. Washington state requires this disclosure. I can't remember if it's P4, P5, it's in the P series, um, but it is a required disclosure for anybody that's in a distressed situation that may be going through a short sale. Uh, the Washington Department of Licensing has put this out um, to ensure that we don't have any problems down the road. Um, also, just a reminder, you guys all have access. If you're going to be a buyer's agent, not a seller's agent like before, that screen before, but you're going to write up a short sale, we have written up two, for, uh, two short sales in the last 30 days. So if you're like, I have not done a short sale in my career, there is a checklist or a recipe that you will need to locate on our resource website. And what you see on the screen is that said um, checklist. Which form do you need? If it's 21, 28, and it goes down the line, but you'll need the short sale addendum. That's 22 SS. And really it's just putting pen to paper and letting that listing agent know that your buyer is serious and is interested in placing an offer on the short sale. They do become competitive, um, and depending on the process, I'll go over some questions that you may want to ask them in a minute, but that is the actual checklist that will help you. Again, a short sale is before the foreclosure, You'll and the foreclosures will have their own paperwork, so you'll have to rely on the listing agent oftentimes to get you um, the foreclosure purchase and sale agreement that you will end up writing up. And you'll have to read through it and your client will actually have to, if they're concerned, run it past their attorney because you are not, you don't have the knowledge to basically go over a legal document like a foreclosure purchase and sale agreement. Most of the time they're going to be as is where the, the bank or the REO or the foreclosure, they're not going to do any repairs and their disclosures are going to be extremely weak. So it's always buyer beware, but Hey, the good news is, you guys, with short sales foreclosures, many of those are fantastic deals where you can basically do what they call a flip, clean it up, fix it up, sweat equity, and as long as it doesn't have too many problems or defects, um, they often can be flipped and for a lot of money. So that's there's a lot of risk, but high risk, high reward game that we play with short sales and foreclosures. Okay, let's go to the next. So if I'm a buyer's agent, a lot of you are like, well, gosh, Rochelle, I've never done a short sale before. And now I found a short sale that's on the market. What kind of questions? How should I, what, what should I be concerned about? You know, if I'm representing a buyer. So these questions on the screen here, I think I've got five or six that I have used in my past um, as of today. And I guess this is good news for all of us. On the, I did a search. Shannon searched out um, some of the Washington. I searched out the Idaho and the Spokane area MLSs just to see how many short sales are really on the market. And active homes, we only looked at active homes. I'm sure there'll be more in condos. There are 28 short sales listed in our Northwest MLS. That's all the counties that the Northwest MLS operates in. There are nine active properties in Spokane. And there's only one um, in North Idaho in the Coeur d'Alene area. So really on the big scheme of things, we're not looking like the 08, 2009 era, but you do need to be aware of some of the questions you may have to ask when you see these properties. 
So some of the questions I would ask would be like, who is the lien holder? If it's not in the agent remarks, ask who the bank is. It does matter. Um, as you know, it matters when we use movement mortgage and movement mortgage often will you know, keep their loans, but sometimes they'll sell their loan to say US Bank or you, know, you might have a bank like it's uh, Penny Mac or you might have a different type of lien holder or bank that you're making those mortgage payments to. So if the short sale is happening, it's help helpful to know who the lien holder or bank is to know whether we're going to get maybe an acceptance from the bank. Um, also to know if there is a truly a hardship, when you look at homes with pictures like I've shown you, you often can see the hardship just with the belongings that they have in their home. They're very sad, um, but not all the time is there a true hardship. The lien holder, the bank who is doing the short sale, has to essentially vet out that situation. They essentially capture all of the information. This packet that we have in number two, do you have a 100% complete short sale package into the lender? Many listing agents who have taken the short sale do not understand or have not done as much short sales as I have to even know what kind of packet they need to put together for the lender to approve the sale. So if they have a 100% complete package, that would be, they would need bank statements, they would need tax returns, they would need things like that in order to have a 100% complete package for the lien holder or the lender. Another good question to ask a listing agent to kind of see, are they well-versed in the short sale process would be, has the negotiator or the loss mitigator been assigned to the file? Many times when we were working in the 2008, 9, 10 era, um, we would have we would send in a hundred percent complete package to the lien holder, but then it, they were so backed up that oftentimes the negotiator, the loss mitigator, had not been assigned, and it would sit and sit and sit, and that short sale would actually be a long sale. We kind of used to joke about that. So if they have a loss a loss mitigator assigned, oftentimes it will go a little bit faster. Can you tell the date the notice of default was posted? Oftentimes you can get with your title company and they will give you, um, they will tell you, hey, we pulled the preliminary title. We did a workup on this one already. Um, and the notice of default was posted on such and such a date. That also oftentimes is an indicator on whether um, you have a chance on what we would consider a viable short sell. Sometimes we'll get so excited and our clients will be so excited. We'll write the short sale offer. They'll accept it. It's in the hands of the lien holder only to find out that unfortunately we don't have enough runway left because the notice of default was posted and it was actually on its way to the foreclosure. So in those cases, unfortunately, there's nothing we can do unless the client is willing to go to the auction block or go to wherever the lien holder is posting the sale and pick it up as a foreclosure or a pre-foreclosure, okay? Has a BPO or appraisal been done on the property and does the home qualify for VA financing or an FHA rehab loan? I say that VA financing because oftentimes it does not qualify. It depends on um, the type of foreclosure, short sale or the like on whether it would qualify. So I put that on there because I get too many questions from newer agents who have not been trained asking me, in my opinion, kind of stupid questions about, does this qualify? It's like, I almost don't want to, Shannon said, do, why are we putting it on the slide? And I said, because I want you guys to think about this before you actually ask the question, you might want to answer that question before you ask the agent. But if it's unclear, you probably want to ask them before you write it up. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, this is an example of one from last, that well, was March of 2023. Um, this, you can see the original price was $335. They oftentimes, lien holders will go ahead. This is a short sell, um, but it's approved now at $275. Notice that they took the listing at $335. They started the process. They probably work with the loss uh, mitigator. And the loss mitigator gave the listing agent basically the plan of how they wanted to run the price. Oftentimes, that's very common. So, in this listing, I wanted to highlight the broker remarks because they it was right here. Short sale approved at 275. So that means that the lien holder has approved the price. And what that means is that if you were a buyer's agent, you might want to ask a few questions like who is the lien holder and who approved it at 275? Is there it says the bank will not go less? 
So again, it might be interesting to know, does that mean, you know, if my buyer needs closing costs, will I have to tack them to the top? Probably, but I would want to have a good conversation with that um, listing agent to understand what that short sale approval is conditioned on as far as 275. Um, it has to go close right away as is, no inspections with their offer. So you're going to have to do your pre-inspection, um, meaning with some of these foreclosures, they turn the power off, you guys. I don't know if you've actually toured some of these properties, but be sure you have, you know, good high powered flashlights because I've toured some of these distressed properties after hours and starts to get dark about five, six o'clock at night. Um, and so it becomes a bit more challenging to get an offer submitted when you can't see the property with good flashlights. Um, this is a checklist that I pulled uh, from my CDPE training. So if you are going to be doing a pre-listing, I love this little sheet that I have here. This is my cheat sheet to make sure that I have a full package if I'm going to be taking a short sell. Um, I make sure that I have fully assessed the seller situation. I have like a form that I use for that. I also go through, I understand the tax records. I'm looking to get information about the taxes. Um, and so you can easily do that with our tax records. I print the deed, meaning I call my title company and I actually print that out. I do a quick search about the neighborhood just to see what's selling, what's um, not selling, what's kind of hanging on the market. And then I do a preliminary lien search. And I do that all with my title company. So most of your title companies will become your best friend if you're going to be doing some distressed properties. At this appointment with the seller, in advance of the meeting, I'll prepare the listing paperwork. I will need authorization to act on their behalf. Most of the lien holders or the banks that you're going to be working with on short sales will have what they, they'll have their own authorization to release information to you on usually their websites, or you'll talk with somebody that's in the loss mitigation department, and they will give you the paperwork that needs to be submitted to act on the seller's behalf. You'll need a hold harmless agreement, and you'll also need a document checklist to make sure that you have your correct pamphlets for the state that you work in, and you'll need a financial worksheet and the HOFA eligibility form. So you'll need to kind of essentially help that seller who's going through distress in basically reapplying. It's it's very backwards. It's like they had to get all of this information collected when they were um, applying for the mortgage. But now if they're in a distress situation, you have to go and spend a, a bunch of time with that seller in helping them to get to go to the bank and say, hey, I'm not able to make that gap up. I'm going through a financial distress situation in my life. And therefore, I need to basically have some forgiveness. And in that case, you're having to reapply, meaning we'll need copies of bank statements, we'll need copies of tax returns and the like. That's what those financial worksheets are meant to do is help guide you through that process. Other things you're typically going to need, you'll see things like the CMA and a camera, tripod, things of that nature. Um, do I hire a professional photographer to do these houses? This one right here on the screen, we did not. Um, and oftentimes you don't need to. So you need to think like a like a BPO agent or a broker price opinion agent who just goes out there and takes pictures for the bank. It's not as necessary um, to take professional photos for these types of properties. Let's go to the next slide. This, these are my questions. This is the questionnaire that I used. I told Shannon we should probably go ahead and post this on our resource website because these are the kinds of questions that I would ask the seller when I'm um, interviewing them to see if it's something that I do want to move forward with. Some of these distressed properties, is not they're not for the faint of heart. Um, and maybe some of them you may want to pick up on your own and work at a deal with a seller and actually... Um, do an off-market where you actually um, go to them as a FISBO. Again, you are licensed, so you are required to provide disclosure, even if you're going to buy this yourself. But these would be the kind of questions that you may want to ask that potential seller. Who is on the title? Is your property already on the market? Is it listed with who? I mean, so these are my set of 23 questions that I use. Do you owe back taxes on the property or liens? So this is my preliminary interview questionnaire that I used um, back in the day when I was interviewing sellers in the distress, distress situation. Questions to ask an REO agent. So I'm almost out of time. That's how fast. I knew I'm almost done. I think I'm on slide 13 or 14. So we're almost done. But 
REO agents, you are going to want to have a different set of questions. This again is if you're a buyer's agent and you see an REO, something that's owned by the bank, will the lender or will the seller, these are questions you would ask the listing agent, will the lender or the seller allow repairs if the appraisal is required? Sometimes the listing agent's pretty easygoing or they're working with a bank that allows for this. Others may not. So you do have to know what is allowed and what's not allowed. I just got done doing one, a distressed property. It wasn't a bank-owned property, not yet anyway. Um, it was a reverse mortgage that a notice of default was actually placed on the property over the holidays. Um, my client or my client was buying it and the uh, seller had passed away. So definitely distressed property. And the question I asked the listing agent before I wrote the offer was, hey, I've got a VA buyer. You're not advertising as a VA. So again, I was asking about financing, but the other question I said is, will the lender allow or will the seller who is the you know trustee of this particular property, will they allow for a repair? Meaning the electrical panel looks like it needs to be replaced. And I know that the VA will call that out. So would it be okay at the buyer's cost if the buyer was to have hire a licensed bonded contractor to come in and go ahead and do that repair? And the Windermere agent said, no problem, go for it. She, he's like, I haven't had an offer in about a month and we definitely need to move before the actual, um, I mean, we've been served notice of default and all of that. So we need to go ahead and move on something here. And I think we can get the seller to go ahead and agree to that. Not only was I able to get something that was, I got, I got my buyer instant equity, about 50 K of instant equity, just by asking some of these questions here on the screen. So I know they work. Will the lender allow the utilities to be turned on for the inspection? Many REO companies or banks, what they'll do is they'll turn off the utilities to save, obviously, on utility bills, but they will require the buyer to pay for and require the buyer to set it up in their name. There's a whole process for doing that, um, and you just have to make sure you just don't go ahead and hire like normal your inspector to go out until you make sure the utilities are turned on. That's a that's a sure way to lose your buyer's inspection money and have to have the inspector go back out, and then it's just such a hassle. Are there offers in the bank? Sometimes it's multiple offers. In fact, most of the time they are right now. And if you see that the offer has fallen through, that would be a good question to ask the listing agent. What happened? Why did it fall through? And oftentimes they will be very much apprised to tell you or, or definitely want to tell you about that. As, as a concluding slide, I have the Foreclo Foreclosure Fairness Act in Washington. Um, it was in existence in 2011. I, get, I don't have the Idaho or the Oregon um, Foreclosure Act um, that they have, uh, but it's basically, you may want to, if you're in that foreclosure or somebody's like, they're already past the point um, and their notice of default and there might not be any saving, it doesn't hurt to talk to somebody. And the person you may want to talk to is mcferrinlaw.com. In Washington, their website, their link is right there. Um, they do consultations for very affordable rates for people that are in these types of situations. So it may be as simple as paying $150. At the time, I'd have to check their rates, but I believe their one hour consult is 150 bucks. And they can be um, consulted with um, before you go out even on the appointment to make sure that there is no other um, option for them as far as that goes. Um, sometimes that's been all I've had to do and to save myself a lot of time and hardship um, in preparing some of these. Some of them are, some you say no to, and some you do say yes to, and some you actually end up picking up yourself and others you, um, unfortunately, there's nothing you can do. So that's some a good resource that will help many of you over there in Western Washington. We're also here to help. Uh, there's Shannon, Candace, and my phone number direct. Um, I'll go ahead and open it up to some questions. I'm right at 601. Happy to go through questions if you have them. If you want to put it in the chat or just unmute your line. Um, I don't know if I covered what you wanted to cover, Candace. So definitely want to open the mic up to Candace. This was perfect and exactly what I was looking for. Um, let's see here. We do have a question. Any ideas that can be shared to comfort the wobbly consumer? <laughs> <laughs> yes, bless their hearts, huh? Um, <laughs> they're so nervous and there's not a lot to be nervous about. When you're dealing with distressed properties, I think there's a lot to be said about working with a true professional 
So if they're working with people like you who have spent the time in getting training, education on distressed properties, there's less to be concerned about. You need to be more confident and again, um, make them, you know, help them understand how much education and training that you actually take to help them with their decision and their buying process. I think that would be the biggest tip I'd give them, Candice, is, you know, how much training and education that I've taken, just making them feel like your des the designated broker of Best Choice Realty at one time did over 50% of the business with distressed makes people feel much more at ease knowing that they have a strong backing of somebody that's helped a lot of people um, get out of some very, very difficult situations. And I pride myself in that. I think that's, that's huge to help people in that way. Um, I've helped people that have had MS, um, bought a, bought a condo on the fourth floor, can't go downstairs anymore. I mean, that was a hardship. And I mean, those types of things happen and it, some things they're out of their control. Now a buyer can come into a situation like that. And if it's properly marketed and disclosed, um, and you're, if you're working with true professionals, you'll have less, um, less concerns or less risk if you're working with true professionals and asking questions, obviously is where it's at. Um, uh, let's see here. Comment. Ruth says, if there are con safety concerns, Freddie and Fannie may fit. So don't, um, you know, not ask the question. They may, um, and they want to avoid the lawsuits. Welcome, Ruth, by the way, too. I'm happy to see you on the, this is her first webinar, I believe. So yes. I, I can't probably... get my camera to work, so I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I, she probably, Ruth's has done, like me, we've done a lot of short sales in the past. I know you, yeah. you've done a ton. Um, yes, great feedback. It looks um, like I have a, a question. Go ahead, oh, Mary. Go ahead. Um, is it true that, um, when, once they sell the short sale, um, do the sellers typically pay taxes because there's no, um, yes. excise tax is worked into the statements, Maricon. So, oh, okay, yeah, Washington State will get their fair share. Um, of the excise tax. So it's something that you, taxes will be, when you get, when you work with the sellers in a distress situation, you'll often have to work with your um, escrow, your closer ahead of time so they can do what they call a preliminary workup. And that will need to also be submitted to the lien holder and that will have taxes on there or estimated taxes. Oh, okay. Thank yep. you. Great question though. Thank you for asking that. Okay. Um, Any other questions? Okay, I think we're good. Yes. It was fast paced, Candace. I, I yes, talked. that was good. That was good. And a lot of like helpful tip sheets. So I like that. We'll I post can get that. Yeah. If I could ask you a question, Rochelle. Um, when I was doing all the Freddie Fanny stuff, what well, was primarily all Freddie Mac. Occasionally it was a different bank, um, but it was through um, the company I used to work for. And um, it was like a referral, it was a whole thing that they did. So right. that's how I did so many of them. I've never done any on my own. Mm. So do, do you maybe think about having a class and how we can approach lenders? Because that would be a really good resource of extra business. Mm -hmm. to do REOs. Yeah, we, I think we should probably get some experienced brokers from the past and we could put together a combined resume. That's what they really need, right? In well, order to get those accounts. Yeah, it, I know how to do BPO as is, as repaired and all those sort of things. I know, and Shannon here, she yeah. she pays the BPO. So she knows the agents in our office that are doing BPOs right now. And that's usually how we enter those, those um, relationships, right? Is yeah. the experience- resume, and then obviously BPOs that we've started to do with our company. So um, yeah, I think that would be a, a good little takeaway from today, Ruth. If we've got some interest, let's see if we can get some more listings from the distressed category. Um, awesome. Anything else, Candice, on your, on your end? We're good to go? I think we are good to go. Okay. Yes. Have a good week, you guys.